Okay, today we're going to talk about one of the most important theorems in all of functional analysis, the Hardy-Banach theorem. So before we discuss the Hardy-Banach theorem, we must talk about hyperplanes. So first, what is a hyperplane? Now, for the course of today, we are only going to talk about real numbers. So, to that end, let V be a vector space over R. Okay? Now, let rho from V to R be a linear functional. So rho takes an element in the vector space and sends it to a real number. Let K be an element of R. Now, we're going to define a hyperplane H, which let's just note H is going to depend on the linear functional we take and the real number we take. It's going to equal the set V in our vector space where rho of V equals K. Okay, so let's visualize this. My personal favorite vector space over R is just R2. So, the plane. And my favorite linear functional, rho, is the projection onto the x-axis. So any point V here gets sent just to its x-coordinate value. Now, the hyperplane, let's take k equals 2. So suppose this is 2. So h is going to be this. This is h. Rho v equals 2. Yes. Just making sure we get the entire screen nicely. Now, we have this hyperplane depending on rho and k. Now, you might ask, is this hyperplane unique to this rho? in this k. Well, let a be a real number. And let v equal a rho. Then, for v in v, v of v equals a rho of v. So what this tells us is if rho of v equals k, then phi of v equals a times k. So h rho k equals h v a k. So these hyperplanes are determined up to these a's. Okay? Now that we understand hyperplanes, there's two important kind of spaces. There's four different, but they come in two varieties. First, there's the open spaces. We're going to say H, O, plus 
to mean the half to be the half open plane going to be the set v in v where rho of v is strictly greater than k. So what does this look like over in R2? Well, this is all v in R2 where rho of v is greater than 2. So it's everything here. It's everything to the right of this line. Now, similarly, h o minus, we're going to be the set v in v where rho of v is less than k. This looks like everything to this side of the line, not including the line. So over here we have h o plus, and over here h o minus. But you ask yourself, this is actually missing this line. h o plus union h o minus is missing a line. We have the other kind of half planes, the closed half planes. H O H C plus V, the set V and V, where rho of V is greater than or equal to K. So for open, we just took strict equality. For closed, we take greater than or equals. So H O plus is everything from here over H C plus. Likewise, our friendly H C minus is the set V in V, where rho of V is less than or equal to K. You talk about these two as the open half planes for H, and these two as the closed half planes for H. Okay. So, is this the only way to view our hyperplane H? Well, if you remember, Every linear functional, every non-zero linear functional, has a null space of co-dimension 1. So, let v naught equal the set x in v, such that x, rho of x, equals 0. So v naught is the null space of rho. And suppose x naught is an element of v, not v naught, but the, act, the entire vector space, where rho of x naught equals k. The fact that your co-dimension 1 means the set x naught plus v naught is everything. And we see if v is in v naught, rho of x naught plus v, well rho is linear, equals rho x naught plus rho of v, but this is zero since v naught is the kernel. This is rho of x naught. So for a hyperplane, we can either write it like this as v and v, rho v equals k, or like this. Okay. And these are equivalent. So why do we get, 
Why do we care about these hyperplanes? We care about these hyperplanes because they give us ways to separate our space, to divide our entire space in two, our entire vector space. And what do I mean about that? by that? Okay. Let let x and y be in our vector space V. We say H, if you remember, is H rho K depends on our linear functional and our K separates x and y if x is contained in the half closed the closed half plane and y is contained in the other half plane so Going back to R2 with this being rho of x equals 2, this is the statement that x is in one of these and y is in the other. Possibly they intersect this line. We say H strictly, strictly separates X and Y if X is contained in H plus O, Y is contained in H minus O. Now, just to avoid some confusion, we don't actually care that x is an h plus o and y is an h minus o. It could be x is an h minus o and y is an h plus o. That's okay. But one must be in one and one must be in the other. In this case, there is this line and x is on one side, and y is strictly on the other, and the two can't even intersect this line. Okay? Now we get to the real Hahn-Binnock separation theorem. So, the real on the knock separation theorem. That is, let x and y be convex sets disjoint so they can have no point in common and one of them has an internal point. Okay? Either, well, then there exists a hyperplane separating them.
So this says that x and y are convex, and one of them contains an eternal point, then there exists some hyperplane in which x is on one side and y is on the other. If one of them is only internal points, then they are in an open half plane. So if X or Y are only internal points. Not only does it separate them, but one is completely on one side of this line. If both are only internal points, H strictly separates them. So this says, if both are only internal points, one of them is on one side of this line, one of them is on the other, and neither of them hit this line. It is this theorem we will spend the rest of this lecture trying to prove. Okay. Without loss of generality, we can assume Y has an internal point. So we know x or y has one, so we might as well say it's y. Next, lemma. internal points. In Y. So Y is the set of internal points. Lemma. Y I is convex. Okay. Let x and y be in yi. So x and y are both eternal points. Let v, well, let t be an element of 0, 1. We want to see that every convex combination of x and y are in yi. But we know x and y are, so we can avoid taking the endpoints of 0, 1. And let V be an element of a vector space. Now, if you remember what it means to be internal, and we'll state it again, since X is an internal point of YI, of Y. There is a C1 greater than 0, so some positive number where x plus C, x plus A times V is still in Y. So 
for 0 less than or equal to a less than c1. So what does this mean? This means we can move x a little close to v and still stay in y. That's what it means to be internal. Now, we know x is internal, but we also know y is internal. There is a c2 greater than 0, where y plus a v is in y for 0 less than or equal to a less than c2. So, we can also move y in the direction of v. Now, we want to show that tx plus 1 minus ty or our convex combination of elements in the yi. We want to show this is still an internal point. So, let's look at plus AV plus, yeah, plus AV for 0 less than or equal to A less than the minimum of C1 and C2. Since both C1 and C2 are greater than 0, the minimum is still greater than 0. Well, this is just going to equal T. We give X T of AV x plus a b. And we give y the 1 minus t of a b. 1 minus t y plus a b. So what does this look like? This is tx plus t a b plus 1 minus t y plus 1 minus t a b. But TAV plus 1 minus TAV is just AV. So this is an equality. But we already know this is in Y. And we also know this is in Y. Right? We showed it here, and we showed it here. So this is a convex combination of elements of Y. So this is an element of Y. Since this is true for all v, tx plus 1 minus ty is an internal point. Since this is true for all x and y, we know that yi is convex. Okay? Next, let's flip our notes to the next page. Lemma. Let y1 be an element of y, and y, you know, let y1 be an internal point, and y be in y. Let a, let 0 be less than or equal to A, be less than 1. Then, A, Y1, plus 1 minus A, Y, is an element of Yi. Okay. No, we know it can't be. Ah. It's the reverse of this. So we know that y might not be in yi. So this has to be 1 minus a y1 plus a y. That's because a. We just, we just said y was some element in y. But y1 
is of course an YI. So how do we show this? Since Y1 is internal, there exists a C greater than zero where Oh. For v in our vector space, there exists a c greater than zero, where y1 plus v times b is an element of y. For zero less than or equal, b less than c. So just definition. Now we know 1 minus a y1 plus b v plus 1 minus a minus a, y1, plus a, b, plus 1 minus b, b. So, we can group this b, v, and this y1 together to get 1 minus a equal y1 plus b, v, plus a, v. y minus, sorry, y1 plus b, v, we know is in y. And a v, oh, yeah, a, ah, uh, y, yeah. Sorry, one minus a y one plus a y plus one minus a b v equals one minus a y one plus b v. Well, that we know. Plus a times y. Right. We just wrote that y one plus b v is still in y. And y, of course, is in y. So this is an element of y. This is true for zero less than or equal. to 1 minus a, b, less than 1 minus a, c. So this is true. This is not 0. 1 minus a is not 0, and t is not 0. So this can range. So it's actually true for 0, less than or equal to d, less than 1 minus a, C. If we replace this, so if instead we had 1 minus a y1 plus a y plus d b v, so it's d v. Since this is non zero, we know 1 minus a y1 plus a y is in fact an internal point. Now, we're going to use these to get yi is only internal points. Or yi equals yi i. For this, Let 
y1 be an element of yi. Take any element of yi. Since y1 is internal, that's an internal point, there exists a c greater than 0 such, well, for v in v, there exists c greater than 0 such that y1 plus a v is an element of y for 0 less than or equal to a less than c. Okay, now take 0 less than or equal to b less than 1. We get y1 plus b a v. Okay? This is going to equal b y1 plus That's it. 1 minus b y1 plus b y1 plus b a b. Okay? We can group these together. 1 minus b y1 plus b y1 plus a v. But what do we know? We know this is in y i, this is in y, and 0 is less than or equal to b is less than 1. So by our lemma, this is an element of y i, this entire thing. So, y1 plus b a v is an element of y i. So, Oh, yeah, that's it. We have, so y1 is an internal point of yi. Nah, this is yi i. You're looking at an internal point of a set of internal points. The subscript can be a little confusing at times. Okay, now we know that yi is only internal points. Okay? So why... Let's erase this first. Someday, someone will make a whiteboard that self-erases. That'll be a great day. Okay, why did we do all of this? Why do we care about these internal points? Let's look. Let x and y be our convex sets 
why having a tunnel point? Our goal is to show there is some hyperplane separating x and y. Now, suppose h, which is going to equal, remember it depends on rho and some real number k, separates x and y. Separates x and yi. So first we're going to suppose it separates yi from x, but not necessarily y from x. We can, without loss of generality, suppose rho of x is less than or equal to k for x and x, rho of y is greater than or equal to k for y an element of y. Okay? Now, take y and y, take any y, oh, this is yi, take any y and y, and y1, an internal point. So we're taking any y and y, and any internal point. Let 0 be less than or equal to a be less than 1. Then, we know a 1 minus a y1 plus a y. Right, we know this from our lemma is in yi. So rho of this guy is greater than or equal to k. Okay. This equals, well, rho is a linear functional. This is an r. This is an r. 1 minus a rho of y1 plus a rho of y. Okay. But we're dealing with a vector space. And this is an analysis class. What do we do in analysis? We take limits. What is the limit of k? k? Yes. So k equals the limit as a as a goes to 1 of k. This I'm sure of. But this is less than or equal to the limit as a goes to 1 of rho 1 minus a of 1 minus a rho y1 plus a rho of y. How do I get this? Well, multiplication and addition in this vector space is continuous. This is an R vector space. Since addition and multiplication are considered continuous, this is valid. So this equals rho of y. Right? This 1 minus a goes to 0. And this a goes to 1. And so, we get our desired quality. Now, what does this mean? This means that we had rho separating x and the internal points. This means we can only look at the internal points. Therefore, rho, oh, not rho, h, separates x and y. So for the remainder of this talk, we are only going to discuss 
the internal points. Okay. First, first, this marker is dying. With dying markers, they go to the trash. So, first, x and y are convex. So, x minus, so, eh, y minus x, this is the union over x in x of y minus the point x is convex. More so, y is internal, or only internal points, has only internal points, so y minus x has only internal points. y minus x looked like you took y and shifted it over here for every point in x. And every point here was internal, so when you shift them over here, they're still internal. Okay? Y intersect X equals the empty set. This was one of our assumptions. So now we're going to try and make the biggest subset of our vector space with these properties. What do I mean by that? Let's look. Now, I told you the Hahn-Binnock theorem is one of the most important theorems. And the tool we're about to use is one of the most common tools in this subject. So watch closely. Let C equal the set. So what are the properties of this set? Well, I just said we want the biggest set like this. Convex, internal points, not empty. It's like it does not. Um, so y minus x does not have zero. We want convex, internal, no zero. So let's see, equal 1, first I want y minus x, c, such that, c, contained in v, such that, y minus x is contained in c. Two, I want then we want C to be convex. C is convex. Three. The third property, only internal. Y minus X has only internal points. Four. Y minus, oh, well, not Y minus it. C has only internal points. 4, 0 is not an element of C. So this is going to be our subsets of sets that, are contain, that contain Y minus X, that are convex, that have only internal points, and don't have 0. Now, 
C, oh. containment, is a partial order on C. C. By that we mean if C1 and C2 are in C, C1 is less than or equal to C2, if and only if C1 is contained in C2. These are sets, so containment always gives a partial order. Next. Y minus X is an element of C by design. So C does not equal the empty set. Let C naught be an increasing chain. i.e. if C1 and C2 are in C, either C1 is less than or equal to C2, or C2 is less than or equal to C1. So C0 is totally ordered. Let C0 be the union, C, an element, script C0 of C. Okay. The question is, does it have these four properties? First, one, zero is not an element of C naught. Why do I say this? Well, all of these C's are in script C, and zero is not in any of these script C's. Uh, zero is not in any element in this script C. So it can't be in any of these C's. So zero is not in it. Two, y minus x is contained in C0. Any C in script C has Y minus X. So of course, this union must contain Y minus X. Three. Is it only internal points? Let X be an element of C0. Then, X is an element of C for some C in C naught. Right? By construction. Since C is an element of C naught, which is contained in C, it has only internal points. So X is internal. So C naught has only internal points. Okay, one left. Four. Let X and Y be an element of C naught and T, the element of 0, 1. Well, X and Y must eventually both be in one of these C's. Either X is in C1, and Y is in C2, which means X is in C2 by containment, or reverse, but either way, they're both in some C1.
but C1 is convex. So Tx plus 1 minus Ty is still in C1, which is contained in C0. This is true for any x and y in any t from 0 to 1. Therefore, C0 is convex. And C0 is an element of C. But what do we know about the C0? Our C is ordered by containment. So, C0 is greater than or equal to C for all C an element of script C. This means C0 is an upper bound in script C of this C0. What does that mean? Zorn's lemon! Zorn's lemma! Ah, uh, always that slip. Okay, bad math joke time. What's yellow in equivalent to the axiom of choice? Hmm? Zorn's lemon! I know, it's a bad joke. So, let's keep this for a few minutes. This says every increasing chain in C has an upper bound by Zorn's lemma. C has a maximal. What it means to have a maximal element is there is some element that is greater than or equal to everything it can be compared to. There might be more than one, so be careful. And let's call this maximal element C, because we really like our C's here. Okay. Let S equal the set A, C, where A is greater than zero, C is an element of C. First thing, zero is not an S. Why is that? If zero were an S, the zero vector, zero would equal A times C. But this is a vector space over R. So, yeah. This is, if and only if, A equals 0 or C equals 0. It is what we call a domain. But 0 isn't in C. And we assume A is greater than 0. So 0 is not an S. Okay. Two. Y minus X is contained in our C. But this is contained in our S. Right? One is greater than zero. Three. Let A and B be greater than 0, X and Y be in C. We see 1 over A plus B of AX plus BY equals A over A plus B times X plus B over A plus B times Y. But A over A plus B plus B over A plus B is 1. 
So this is a convex combination of elements of C. And C is convex. So this is an element of C. So AX plus B is some non-zero multiple of an element of C. S is convex. And by construction, S has only internal points. What does this mean? S is an element of C. So S is an element of script C. But S contains C. It's kind of hard. We said C was maximal, but we found a possibly bigger element. There's only one way for that to happen. So, S equals C. Now, this kind of tool is one of your biggest friends in infinite dimensional vector space theory. We didn't have to do all of this for finite dimensions. Right? All of these tools with constructing these infinite chains weren't necessary. But V might be infinite dimensional, in which case this is required. And if you notice, we had to take Zorn's le lemma. So we have to assume the axiom of choice. But we should be okay with that. I like the axiom of choice. We go to this page, look to this page. Okay, next. Let X and Y be an element of C. A be greater than or equal to zero. B be greater than zero. And Z, X, Y, B, and V be an element. Or a vector space but not in this very large set C. We know AX plus BY is an element of C. Got that. Great. And we know BV is an element of V minus C. Why do we know that? Suppose we could so here is our C, and here is our V. Suppose we could take some non-zero guy and go out here into our C. But then this map is scaling by a non-zero element. That can't happen. So BV is not an element of V minus C. Okay. Now, let's erase this too. This set is going to be main important. So let's just keep those three things up for the moment. Let X y be in v minus c, and a and b be an element b greater than zero. What I want to show, ax plus by 